Well, good morning, everybody, and uh, good morning to anyone who is listening to this afterwards at another time. We welcome you here. Uh, this is the devotional morning times that we hold at uh, Christ Central, and my name's Ian Brown. In a moment, I'm going to continue with our series in Mark chapter 2, but first of all, uh, let's c commit this time to the Lord in prayer. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you for another morning. I thank you for this opportunity to be with you and to be also with brothers and sisters in the church as we can have fellowship together under your word. And we pray that we will be indeed led by your Holy Spirit as we look into this passage and that there will be something for all of us. May your spirit speak in the quietness to each one, giving comfort giving assurance, and giving challenge as well. For Jesus' sake, amen. Our passage is Mark chapter 2, 18 to 22, and I'm going to read it to you now from the ESV. Now John's disciples and the Pharisees were fasting, and people came and said to him, why do John's disciples and the disciples of the Pharisees fast, but your disciples do not fast? And Jesus said to them, Can the wedding guests fast while the bridegroom is with them? As long as they have the bridegroom with them, they cannot fast. The days will come when the bridegroom is taken away from them, and then they will fast in that day. No one sews a piece of unshrunk cloth on an old garment. If he does, the patch tears away from it, the new from the old, and a worse tear is made. And no one puts new wine into old wineskins. If he does, the wine will burst the skins, and the wine is destroyed, and so are the skins. But new wine is for fresh wineskins. May God bless that uh, passage to us. I wonder if you ever get criticised uh, by others for what you do. Maybe you get criticised and in some sense persecuted for being a Christian and trying to live like Jesus and trying to do things right. In today's passage, Jesus was being criticized and it actually in a series of three, we've got to look back to yesterday and I think on to tomorrow's passage that follows, it's a series of occasions when Jesus is being criticized for what he does. Yesterday, he was criticised for eating and drinking and socialising with publicans and sinners, as they were called in the authorised version. Publicans and sinners. I like that phrase. Uh, I used to uh, uh, be friendly with a chap in Somerset who was quite a well-known public figure. He was the town crier. And he had had um, a background in the church where I sometimes used to preach in Radstock. And uh, he owned, or at least he was the landlord of a pub that was very popular that um, I used to visit. And leaning across the bar one day, he said to me, Jesus came for publicans and sinners, and I qualify on both counts. Um, well, of course, publicans, as referred to in the Bible, doesn't mean uh, people who keep pubs, landlords. It meant people who worked for the state, as we saw yesterday, um, uh, people who were tax collectors, in this case, uh, for the Romans. So they were thought of as very uh, evil sinners, the lowest of the low, not only were they working for the other side, but they were pocketing money for themselves. And yet Jesus was associating with such people in quite a, an intimate way. He was reclining with them at uh, the meal in yesterday's story. We didn't actually go into that detail, but 
uh, in the old days, they didn't sit up as we might be sitting up now at dining tables, but they sort of semi-reclined a bit like this, leaning across and leaning uh, 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 against one another. Uh, and Jesus was doing this, reclining at ease with sinners. I always remember that because um, nearly 70 years ago in the Latin lesson, I was reclining a bit like this on my desk and the Latin master said, we're doing the verb reclinare to recline. And if you want to know what recline is, look at Brown because he's reclining on his desk. Sit up straight. Now, Jesus was criticized yesterday and he's criticized today in this passage. Uh, this time, for the fact that his disciples were doing different things from the disciples of John the Baptist and the disciples of the Pharisees. The Pharisees didn't have disciples in the same way as John and Jesus did, but there were people who adhered to the Pharisee version of religion. I don't like the word religion, it suggests doing things, doing things. I'd much rather be called a person of faith. But that is really the substance of what we have in our reading today. The contrast between a religion, a doing things, a dry and dusty uh, following regulations uh, type of system, and the system that we now have on the new covenant of being free in the spirit, having the new covenant and having the blessing of the Holy Spirit, it's like uh, new wine. Whereas the other is like stuffy, old, hard uh, leather wine bottles. So that is the challenge. These Pharisees had got stuck in the way of religion and doing things, not doing things. That was their life. Uh, let's be fair about this. Uh, uh, Christians are required to live a good life and avoid uh, sins uh, and do certain things. Uh, but the law had only required, according to Leviticus 16, 29 and 31, uh, the law had said fast on the day of atonement. Uh, I needn't go into all the details. I've been looking at the uh, uh, special days of the Jews throughout the Jewish calendar year but basically um, fasting Jesus is not against fasting fasting is not a bad thing but what the Pharisees had done they had taken a law that said fast um, annually on the day of atonement the actual words are afflict yourselves self-denial is not a bad thing to deny ourselves now and again but the Pharisees has added to it. They said, do it uh, twice a week, twice a week fast, as well as adding uh, various other fasts for special days and occasions in the year. Jesus's response to this is that it's like he is the bridegroom. The bridegroom has appeared at the wedding. Rejoice and be glad, don't be uh, legalistic and going into all these self-denials. This is not the time for that. Jesus is with us and he's saying when he's not here then it may be different. Uh, as I say he's not against fasting, there, there may be a time for fasting, but the picture of union that Jesus is using here, the picture of the bridegroom and the bride is of course a most intimate one. If we look at other parts of scripture, um, uh, Jesus um, is referred to in many other words. He is the king over his subjects. He is the Lord over his servants. He is the shepherd over his straying flock. But what we see in today's passage is that Jesus is the bridegroom with the church as his bride. This suggests the greatest unity, doesn't it? The greatest uh, union, the greatest intimacy, and the greatest protection, if I may dare to say, of the weaker vessel. The husband is there to protect the wife. 
So if you're feeling vulnerable today, if you're feeling weak or lonely or downtrodden or ridiculed or any of these things, here's the application. You are married to the King. You are married to the Lord Jesus Christ. You have great status because the Bible says in Isaiah 54 and 5, your maker is your husband. Almighty God who created this universe and all that it is, is in it, he is your husband. What a wonderful, intimate thing that is. And the second thing that we can learn from this passage is that, uh, yes, there are differences between different disciples. Uh, John wasn't altogether a heretic. I mean, uh, John's uh, teaching, as it were, was limited. He was preparing the way for Jesus. John had his disciples. But what I'm trying to say is this. We have learned recently from Richard Peet's um, uh, excellent uh, series on church history. We have learned that all the time throughout church history, there will be differences between one set of Christians and another. It will go this way, it will flow this way, one lot will think this is important, another will say, no, 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 this is important. And that's just how it is. There have always been such differences. So what we learn from this passage is that even at this time, John's disciples were doing one thing, Jesus' disciples were doing another. And that is how it is, isn't it? There are people who think that um, uh, adult believers' baptism is important. Others will say we can baptize babies. Others will have different views on uh, how a church should be governed. Others will have different views, just as they were talking about here, about observing special days. Uh, some would say, well, we'll observe Christmas and Easter um, uh, and Pentecost, uh, but maybe Palm Sunday and Ascension Day and Harvest Thanksgiving aren't so important. Others will have all these things built into their calendar. Uh, the important thing is the essentials of the gospel. What are the essentials of the gospel? Have we got those right? Because on the last day, it's not going to matter about some of the details, but there will be things that do matter. Have we received the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ? Have we the Holy Spirit in our lives, changing our lives? Because coming back to the closing pictures, uh, and by the way, this is a difficult passage. I mean, yesterday's was a relatively easy one. But this is quite difficult. Scholars don't agree and can't fully understand what is meant by these pictures of the Holy Spirit or Jesus coming into your life. And it's now like two things. Listen to these illustrations of Jesus. It's like sewing a piece of unshrunk cloth onto an old garment. That's one. The other one, it's like putting new wine in old wineskins. Difficult to understand these things, but I suppose in some sense, uh, my PhD is in elasticity. So I suppose stretching of things is something I ought to know about, although we don't often apply this, but stretching. I've got an old apron and every time it goes through the wash, it gets smaller and smaller. It shrinks. So we're all familiar with the idea that clothes shrink. Uh, with age and washing. And so if you have a garment that has a split in it and you replace it, um, what does it say? No one puts an unshrunk piece of cloth on an old garment. So if the old garment has uh, 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 shrunk to a certain extent and then you put in another piece um, that hasn't shrunk, then the different tensions in those uh, two garments will cause the rent to get worse. And the other illustration is this. No one puts new wine into old wineskins. Now, um, I may be wrong about this, but uh, it appears that wine was held in containers that were made out of old skins like leather. And as you know, old leather um, gets 
uh, hard and rigid, whereas a, a new, um, a, a newer piece of leather would be more soft and subtle. And also, I understand that new wine uh, would be there would be a fermenting process, and this would cause uh, stress on uh, this containing material. So here we have elasticity again. We have stress, uh, and an old rigid. Uh, uh, wine skin under that stress would be likely to fracture and break and leak, whereas new wine needs to be in soft, flexible um, material leather, so uh, we don't have that calamity. So, how is this a picture of ourselves? Well, the picture, again, scholars, as I say, scholars don't don't agree on this, but the picture is that we have been blessed with the Holy Spirit. We have been blessed with the new covenant of God's grace. So that although it's not a case for license and uh, we can do whatever we like and not bother with anything like self-denial or fasting, Jesus is not speaking against that. But uh, we have uh, liberty and freedom, don't we, in Christ. And therefore we should uh, rejoice uh, and uh, that is the, the 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 message you see the um there's a, there's a scripture somewhere that says um there are those who have the form of godliness but deny its power to timothy 3 5. so the new disciples of jesus did not have so much of this form of religion of godliness but they had more of the power of godliness so this power was causing, well, causing the old dead wine skins to crack. Well, what it's referring to, of course, is these Pharisees who were set in their ways, set in their ways like a hard, rigid old piece of leather. And of course, old people like me are, tend to be a bit like that, don't we? With old age, we, we tend to think the old ways are best. And I think in the parallel passage of this, it actually says this, the old is best. And so that's what they're thinking. That's their way of life hang on to the old, hang on to the old covenant. It's easier to do this, do that, and we make our money by being the Pharisees. We do this, we do that. But no, Jesus has come with a new covenant. Rejoice, I must stop, I'm going on too long. Just rejoice, because we have the new wine. And now in a moment, we're going to come to prayer. And <laughs> I, I got this old uh, uh, hymn book out yesterday, and I'm just, as we come to prayer, going to read another verse from an old hymn that talks about prayer. And I'm including this because there may be some who, whenever you come to a time of open prayer, um, in any of our prayer meetings, there's always a tendency not to pray. I think you people are pretty good. But um, there may be those who don't, feel up to praying aloud. Um, but let me tell you this, prayer is not only speaking eloquently, it can be. It says prayer is the simplest form of speech that infant lips can try. It can just be very simple. But again, prayer is the sublimest strain that reaches the majesty on high. But what I want to share is this verse. Prayer is the burden of a sigh the falling of a tear, the upward glancing of an eye, when none but God is near. So just remember that uh, if you find prayer difficult, uh, even a groan, even a tear counts as prayer. Let's turn to prayer now, Julian, thank you. <laughs> 